Good afternoon, everyone, and a warm welcome to today's program for the Texas Science Festival. My name is Sharda Jogi, and I'm a professor in the Department of Astronomy at UT Austin. I know that many of you in our community have been impacted by the storm last week, so I would like to thank you very much indeed for taking the time to join us today. This is really a great time to escape, actually, and to celebrate science. And in this session on cosmic beginnings, we are going to explore important questions like where did we come from? How did this wonderful and rich universe that we live in come to be? How is it evolving? And before we begin our journey, I want to just uh, address a few logistical details. So note that all participants will be muted and without video for the duration of this talk. Each speaker will have 10 minutes and then we will move to Q&A. So if you have any question you would like to submit during the session, please hover over the bottom center of your screen and there's a Q&A button and you can submit your question for our speakers at any time. We also have some pre-submitted question from you that we will try to cover and we'll do our best to get through what we can. So it is my great pleasure today to welcome professors Caroline Morley and Stephen Finkelstein, who will be the speakers for our session. So let me introduce Caroline as our first speaker. Caroline Morley is an assistant professor in the Department of Astronomy. She received the 2020 Annie Jump Cannon Award for outstanding research from the American Astronomical Society. And she's really a world leader in the studies of planets and atmospheres. So Caroline, please take it away. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction, Sharda. It is great to be here to talk to you all. And today I'm going to tell you how in our lifetimes we might go about answering the question, are we alone? So this, of course, is not a new question. For generations, uh, humans have been looking up at the sky and imagining the worlds we might find. Once we could see some of these worlds in detail, we started seeing things on the surface that made us wonder what kind of life might live there. So when people first turned telescopes at Mars, they thought they saw these giant canals and started imagining the kinds of beings who would create a, a set of canals on the surface of Mars. People looked at Venus, this world closer to our sun than us, enshrouded in clouds and imagined a tropical paradise filled with exotic creatures. But what I'm going to tell you today is about, oh, and, and uh, we still imagine how we might meet some of these uh, extraterrestrial beings and how those first interactions might go. But what I'm going to tell you today is how in the scientific community, we are closer than ever before to being able to determine whether there actually are other life forms in the galaxy. And this is for lots of different reasons, but I think this puts us at a very special place in human history. So why am I optimistic that we'll be able to do this within our lifetimes? So some of the first advances have come in biology. So we now see from our studies of extremophiles, which are organisms that live in really extreme conditions, we see things like these tardigrades, which are microscopic organisms that have been found in all kinds of environments harsher than we have ever imagined life could survive in. So what we really see here is that life can survive in more places than we ever imagined. And so some of these harsh environments in space, they could also potentially survive in those. We're learning more and more about the planets in our own solar system as well. And so this video is, was taken a week ago. This is a video taken by a lander as it was landing on the surface of Mars, the Perseverance lander. This is incredible. This took my breath away. We have never been able to take a video like this before. So what have we learned about our solar system? We've learned that planets like Mars used to have environments with liquid water on the surface, a thicker atmosphere that could have been exactly the kind of place that life could survive if it was there. 
Perseverance, this new lander that just got to Mars and is booting up this week, is actually designed to be able to find relics of ancient life if that life was there in the distant past when Mars uh, could have had a habitable environment. We're all very excited about the results that will be coming from these kinds of missions that will be sensitive to past life in our solar system. But I think one of the most promising directions actually looks beyond our little solar system around our single star. So we've learned a huge amount about other solar systems over the course of the last 30 years since the first planets outside our solar system were found. There have some been, been some dedicated space missions that have looked at these exoplanets, planets outside the solar system, like the Kepler Space Telescope, which operated from about 2009 to 2018, which really took our first inventory, asking the question, what kinds of planets are common in our galaxy? The TESS Space Telescope is flying now. It's really looking all over the sky at our very nearest neighbors, so the bright nearby stars to us, really surveying, okay, what is close by to us? What planets are there? And the planets that have been found by these missions are incredible. So here we're gonna look at a time-lapse starting in the early 90s when the first planets were found. Each time a planet is found, it'll appear on your screen and a, a chime plays as well as it's found. These planets, we find them all over our entire galaxy. Everywhere we look, we see planets. Some of these planets are large planets. They're, they're larger than our own Jupiter, which is the biggest planet in the solar system. Some of these planets are small. They're the size of the Earth or even smaller. We're finding more and more of them as we look. Some of these planets orbit huge stars. Some of these planets orbit the very smallest stars. And the search for these has really taken off over the last 10 years or so. We're finding going from hundreds of planets to thousands and thousands of exoplanets we've been able to discover. Um, so this is the haul so far. This will stop in 2019, just after we crossed the threshold to finding 4,000 planetary systems. Um, so this, it's been amazing to be in this field as it's really taken off and we found thousands of planets. Okay, so why is this important in our search for life? Well, when I was born, we didn't know when we looked up at the night sky and saw stars there, we didn't know how many of those stars were likely to have planets. Was something that formed like our solar system common or was it really rare to form a planetary system like our own? But now if you go out to West Texas where the skies are really dark and you can see millions of stars in the sky, that each of those stars likely has a planet that's orbiting it. And something like 10% of those stars may actually have a planet that's the right size and the right distance from the star where we think that it could be the best conditions for life to potentially form. So this is really important because this means that even if the formation of the first biology, the origin of life is a rare occurrence, we have lots and lots of planets that it could possibly have happened on. So the numbers are in our favor for there being life outside of our own solar system. And we're starting to learn more and more about these planets. So Steve Finkelstein later on in this is gonna tell you more about the James Webb Space Telescope, which is a telescope that's launching hopefully this year. Um, but the James Webb Space Telescope will allow us to go from saying, okay, we know that these planets are really common to really knowing whether the conditions that we think we need for life are actually common. So we think on, on our own planet, we needed the oceans on the earth and the atmosphere of earth to be able to actually have life originate. James Webb will give us information about whether that's common or not in our galaxy. And then we're thinking very hard about how we would actually detect life if it's there. So how might we see that? So one of the ways that we can see that is by taking the light that comes from a planet and breaking it up into a rainbow of different colors of light. If you do this for the planet Earth, that's what's shown here, you can see all kinds of signs in this spectrum of different colors of light. You see all kinds of signs that there is life here on our own planet. 
So the oxygen that's in Earth's atmosphere is produced by living organisms on Earth. The trees on Earth, right, are making oxygen. We can see that uh, plants reflect light in a certain way that we might be able to see on an extrasolar planet. We see water vapor in our atmosphere from the evaporation of our oceans. We can also see signs of geology like carbon dioxide and methane that tells us that there's uh, bacteria and animals on the surface of our planet. So we wanna be able to take a spectrum of an exoplanet like this to be able to see some of these molecules in an extrasolar atmosphere. And people are starting to design really ambitious missions that would be able to do this. So there's a few different mission designs out there right now. Such a mission would fly in about the 2030s and really be able to look for signs of extrasolar biology for the first time. One of the design missions uh, looks like the image here on the left side of your screen. You have a telescope and then away from the telescope, you fly a special device called a star shade. It's like a big sail out there in space. Um, you fly that and it blocks out the light from the star that the planet is orbiting around. And that actually lets you see the light from one of those planets itself. Um, and once you can do that, it might look something like the image on the right here. This is an example based on our solar system of what we think the solar system would look like as observed uh, with a telescope like this from afar. We'd be able to see Jupiter, Venus, and Earth in our own solar system. And so we'd get this beautiful uh, pale blue dot that told us that there was a planet that maybe looked something like the Earth there. And then we could break up that light from that extrasolar Earth-like planet, and we might get a spectrum. This is again breaking that light into these different colors. We might get a spectrum that looks something like this. This would be the spectrum of a lifetime for somebody like me to be able to observe. In this spectrum, we could potentially see signs of life like oxygen, methane, water, and ozone um, in these different features that you can see uh, on this plot. So I will close here and say that as I've said, I think we're the closest we've ever been in human history to answering this question that has plagued us since humans first started walking the earth of are we alone? This is really interdisciplinary. I think biology tells us that life is really resilient. Planetary science is really letting us look in the solar system for signs of past life. Um, and advances in astronomy really tell us that planets are so abundant. I think astronomers are very optimistic that there are lots of places that life could potentially form. And we're designing missions to be able to actually see those signs of life in the next 20 years. Uh, so thank you very much. And I will take any questions. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Wonderful. So thank you very much for this very inspiring talk. Um, so we have some questions from the audience that I will now share with you. So our first question is from Ryan, who asks, do you think we may be the only intelligent life forms in our own universe? Yeah, so that is a wonderful question. As, you, as you've seen from my talk, I'm very optimistic about uh, life existing, some kind of biology existing off of our own planet. I think the question of whether there's intelligent life is much more complicated. Uh, so one of the things that people wonder about is if there's intelligent life that can communicate between star systems, why hasn't that intelligent life come looking for us or sent us a message of some kind? Um, and so I think that that's a really good question. And I'm not sure that I have a compelling answer to that. Um, so my guess um, is that biology is common, but perhaps the jump from having uh, micro microbes on the surface of your planet to intelligent life is a big step that's not as common. Wonderful, thank you. So our next question is from Danielle. So let me, and I'm not sure we, uh, we can really estimate this accurately, but um, do your best. How many planets are potential homes for human? Oh, how many planets could be homes for humans? That's a good question. So I think if we were going to look for another home in a, a nearby star system, we would want to do that in a star system that was really close to our own Earth 
because you know the, the nearest star is light years away. It would take a very long time to get there. So I, I think that really we'd be looking at a pretty short list of, of planets in the end. Um, but one that could be an interesting uh, planet to live on would be there's a, a planet that it's probably at about the right distance from its star around the closest star to us, Proxima Centauri. So mm -hmm. I might start with that one and see whether that was a good spot to go and then and then go from there. Wonderful. Thank you. So our next one is from Alan. Let's see. Alan has a question here. So this one pertains to the first question you had, um, but it, uh, it talks about the different dimension of it. So Alan asks, what if any existing, existing plants are there for handling contact with other intelligent life in the universe? Yeah, that's also a really good question. So how do we handle if intelligent life actually reaches out to us in some way? Um, so the agreement among people who study this, so the people who do the search for extraterrestrial intelligent life study, um, is that they as a community will all share what that signal is so they can verify it amongst each other. And so it'll be kind of this, this immediate sharing amongst the community if one of those researchers finds a sign of intelligent life. And then I think the jury is out over what happens next. I think everybody is gonna know about it, but then I think that um, probably it's gonna get really complicated and, and maybe some governments might even try to step in um, and think about what the best response would be. Um, so that would be something very interesting to watch if that happens in, in our lifetimes. Okay. So we have some direct questions that have come in. Uh, so we have one from Jacqueline. Jacqueline asked, if or when we find life, do you think that it will be carbon-based? Ah, yes. Uh, so I think that carbon is a very good atom for forming lots of different kinds of molecules um, and having lots of different kinds of chemical reactions. And so I, I think it's very likely if we find life, we will find carbon-based life. Another reason for that is that it's much easier to see and verify life that is more similar to what we understand to be life here on our own planet. And so I think when we when we look outside, we try to have a really broad mind about what kind of life could exist, but it's going to be most easy to say, yes, this is definitely life, the closer it is to life on our own planet and all of our life is carbon based. Yes, life as we know it. So yes, thank you, Caroline. So uh, there is another question here. Next one up is Anu, who's asking uh, something tied to the image, this wonderful image of the landing on Mars that you showed. So do you personally think there's life on Mars? There is almost certainly, as far as I'm concerned, not currently life that is living on the surface of Mars. Um, I think many people are extremely optimistic that there could have been life on Mars in the past. Um, and there's a few reasons for that. Some people think that um, because we think the conditions were right, there was water on the surface of Mars, um, that life could have formed there as, as a different origin of life. But another thing that could happen is it's actually pretty common for meteorites to actually come from different planets to each other. So you can have an asteroid hit Mars, knock off some rocks that then come and hit the Earth. And because we now know life is so resilient, it can survive probably in space for those kind of short distances between Mars and Earth. I think it's possible that life could actually have transferred to Mars from Earth after it formed. And so I think, I think we might see evidence for that if we see evidence for life on Mars with one of these missions. Oh, that's fascinating. So indeed, um, so we have a few more questions. Let me just parse through here. Um, so we have one that I think you touched upon a little, Caroline, and it was about different mission. Uh, so this question is from Trisha, who says, can you please elaborate on how telescope of different wavelength can actually, when combined, help us to answer some of the big questions that you have raised? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. So we, uh, we like to, as astronomers, look in as broad a set of colors, as broad wavelengths as possible. Um, for planets especially, we're looking for these absorption features from different molecules, um, where these little dips in, in the spectrum. And these absorption features happen at different wavelengths. And so 
if you look in optical wavelengths, you can see things like oxygen have strong features. If you look in the UV, that's where ozone absorbs a lot. That's why the ozone layer protects our skin from the sun. Um, and if you look out in the infrared, uh, there's lots of different molecules, things like methane and water, all absorb strongly in the infrared. The more different molecules we can detect in an exoplanet, the more we're able to understand all of the chemistry and biology and geology that could be happening on the surface of the planet that's all getting mixed into the atmosphere and changing what we would be able to see. So the, the kind of broader coverage that we can get, the better we're able to actually figure out what's going on on a planet. Okay, great. So now we are starting to be towards the end of our Q&A time. So I will, I have a number of questions that have come in. I'm trying to look for something that's a bit different from what we have addressed um, so far. Um, so let's see here. There's one question that has come on the solar system and I will add my own question to that. So the question from Lou is, what is the most likely place to find life in our solar system? And I will also add to that a question uh, I have of how can we use lessons we have learned from our own solar system to help us in this journey to understand exoplanet outside our solar system? Yeah. So the places people think of in the solar system to look for life are basically narrowed down by places that have liquid that we think life could have originated and survive in. So li having liquids is really important. Usually liquid water. Water is very abundant. It's in lots of places. Where we see that in the solar system, we think the past surface of Mars, Earth, obviously, and then the, there's actually these little moons around the giant planets in our outer solar system, and some of those actually have subsurface oceans. So mm -hmm. underneath the surface, there's, there's a lot of water, and so we wonder, and we're thinking about missions and sending missions to look to see whether there could be life in any of those places as well. Um, I would say that we, you know, in exoplanets, we largely think about surface life, um, because we can only look at the surfaces of exoplanets, we can't drill down uh, under the surfaces. And so looking at our solar system, I think we've learned a lot from the difference between uh, the planet Venus and our own Earth. So we know that Venus was just, you know, a little bit closer to the sun. And that triggered this set of events where Venus actually evaporated all of its oceans into the atmosphere and then actually lost that water to space. And so Venus no longer has any kind of oceans that could be a good place for, uh, for life to form. So when we look at exoplanets, we really try and look at the examples of Venus versus Earth and figure out, okay, which of these exoplanets could actually have had kind of the, the life experience that would allow it to, to have life today. Great. Okay, so thank you very much, Caroline. That was fascinating. And now, although we have more questions coming in, I think we have to move on to the second part of our session. So uh, our next speaker is Steve Finkelstein. So Steve is an associate professor in the Department of Astronomy. Um, and Steve is a pioneer and a leader in the study of the first galaxies, or if you want, the early galaxies in the universe. And Steve will be one of the very first scientists chosen in the world to use uh, NASA, NASA's James Webb Space Telescope to study the system, and perhaps on a longer term, our UT-founded Giant Magellan Telescope as well to study this fascinating system. So Steve, the floor is yours, and you have a lovely background, I see. Thank you, Sharda, and thank you everyone for being here today. We're going to continue our conversation about cosmic beginnings, but we're gonna take it uh, to kind of the extreme ends of the universe. So the title of my talk is Cosmic Beginnings, the Formation of the First Galaxies in the Early Universe. And we're gonna start with a bit of um, a timeline. So let's talk about the beginning. So in the beginning, there was nothing. And then somehow there was something. About 13.8 billion years ago, our universe formed in an event that we now call the Big Bang. The Big Bang was the formation of everything that we know of, all matter, all energy, and even the concept of time that we know of in our universe. Thanks to modern cosmology, we can now pinpoint the time of this to, as I said, about 13.8 billion years ago. But once the Big Bang happened, you didn't have stars and galaxies like we have today, 
the universe had to take time to evolve to first form even matter, even protons out of the energetic hot soup that came after the Big Bang, eventually stars, and then eventually galaxies, such that about 13.8 billion years later, we have beautiful morphologically complex galaxies like today, such as the Andromeda galaxy, our nearest large spiral neighbor galaxy to our own here on the upper right, very massive elliptical galaxies like M87 here, and a whole zoo of different galaxy types. And so 13.8 billion, 13 billion years might seem like a long time, but space is pretty vast. And so I often think of it as a fairly short amount of time. How do you go from essentially nothing to these beautifully complex galaxies? And so this is the field of galaxy evolution uh, where I do my work. So this is the question here. How do we go from a big bang to these galaxies in about 13.8 billion years? So let's take a look at the timeline and I'll tell you what we do know and then we'll talk a lot about what we don't know. So at some point, 13.8 billion years ago, the universe began at time equals zero here. And then all the way over here on the right, we are at today with our nice big spiral galaxies and elliptical galaxies. We actually know a little bit more about the early universe from modern cosmology. We can actually see the remnant glow left over from the Big Bang. We call this the cosmic microwave background radiation. And with that radiation, when we take a picture of the sky at these wavelengths, we can actually see what the universe looked like about 400,000 years after the Big Bang. So this is a baby picture of the universe. And what we learn is that the baby universe was fairly smooth. It kind of looks the same no matter which direction you look in, but there are tiny little regions that are hotter and tiny little regions that are colder, slightly, slightly hotter, about one part in 100,000 hotter than the average. And it was actually those hotter regions that we think fed the formations of galaxies and ultimately galaxy clusters and big structures like we have today. Coming to where we're at today, Using telescopes, we can actually look back in time because light takes time to travel through the universe. When you look at an object that's far away, you're not seeing it as it is now, you're actually seeing it as it was in the past because it took that light time to travel to us. For example, the Andromeda galaxy shown up here, it's about two and a half million light years away. So when you go look at Andromeda and you can actually see it with a, with a fairly small telescope from your backyard, you're seeing it as it was a little over two million years ago. Now, not a lot happens in a couple of million years, so it probably doesn't look terribly different today, but we can take that to much larger scales, to billions of light years, and look billions of years into the past. And one of the things we've learned is that galaxies like our own Milky Way didn't really begin to form until about 10 billion years ago. And so this sequence of galaxy shapes that we now call the Hubble sequence, after Edwin Hubble, who had a, had a hand in identifying these different shapes of galaxies, uh, really took place about 10 billion years ago. Before that, galaxies were much more irregular in shape. We can take another big step back about over 12, uh, sorry, over 13 billion years ago, only half a billion years or 500 million years after the Big Bang, and we still find galaxies. The most distant galaxy we know of today is coming from this time, about half a billion years after the Big Bang. So we have already peered about 95% of the way back in the history of the universe until we have hit our limit. We've hit the limit of today's telescopes for a couple of reasons that I'll cover in just a minute. But we have this pretty big gap here between this very, very young baby picture of the universe and these earliest galaxies we've been able to find. And so the question that's driving my research is when did the first galaxies form out of these cosmic dark ages? At some point, stars and galaxies began to form, but it took time for gas to cool from that very hot event known as the Big Bang. How and when did that happen? So why should you actually care? Um, a lot of people wonder, astronomy is maybe not very applied science, why should we actually care? Uh, there are a lot of ways to answer this. Um, today, I'm gonna share with you one of my favorite, which is that this really defines the human story. Uh, we, you, everything around us, our planet, your phones, your computer, your house, we're all made of heavy elements which formed in stars. The first galaxies that I'm searching for, these were the sites of the creation of these first heavy elements. The descendants of these galaxies became our own Milky Way. So by identifying when galaxy formation began, we are identifying the first chapter of the story leading to human existence. So the next question might be, why haven't we actually found these galaxies yet? They're out there. Why can't we find them? And there are two reasons. One is that these first galaxies to form are very far away, so they're very faint. You know this intuitively when you move away from a light source, it appears dimmer to you. And the reason why as shown by this very simplistic diagram of a light bulb, is that every patch on that surface of a light bulb, the brightness that you perceive from that patch 
uh, goes down as one divided by the distance squared. So if you are, say, one meter away, you'll detect some amount of brightness from that light. If you're two meters away, the light intensity goes down by one fourth. If you're three meters away, it goes down by one ninth, so on and so forth. So far away things are faint. That means we need big telescopes to be able to see them. And the second more complicated one is that the universe is expanding. All galaxies are moving away from us and more distant galaxies are moving away at more rapid speeds. And so everything's moving away from us. You might say, fine, how does that matter? And that's because we have to deal with the Doppler effect when applied to light. You might be more familiar with this when applied to sound. If you hear an ambulance siren or a police siren coming towards you, you might hear the pitch increase as the sound waves get squeezed together when you hear them. And when it moves away from you, you might hear the pitch decrease as those sound waves get more spread out. And the same thing happens with light. If, you, uh, if I was to turn on a flashlight and run at you at an appreciable fraction of the speed of light, you would perceive that light as being a little bit bluer than it actually is. Likewise, if I was to run away from you really rapidly, you would perceive it as being a little bit redder. And so the bottom line here is all galaxies are moving away from us. So all galaxies appear more red than they actually are. And because this red shift depends on the velocity and really distant galaxies are moving away from us really rapidly, their light is shifted by a lot. All of the visible light that we could see with our eyes is completely shifted out of the visible into the near infrared wavelength regime. And so that means we need near infrared sensitive telescopes to be able to see these galaxies. This is what we've got so far. We have, there, there are a lot of telescopes that we have, but this is the best. This is the Hubble Space Telescope. It's 30 years old. It's in space, it's doing great. It hasn't been serviced in over a decade yet. It's still trucking along and I love Hubble. But Hubble does have a few limitations. First of all, it's primary mirror. You can think of telescopes like big light buckets and the amount of light they can gather is proportional to the size of their bucket, which is the size of their mirror, okay? It's primary mirror is 2.4 meters in diameter. It's about the, the width of your average NBA center, which is kind of big, but if you were to put Hubble on the ground, it would be very much on the smaller end of telescopes. It's in space above the atmosphere, so that helps it, that gives it an advantage, but it's still a relatively small telescope. Its instruments are sensitive primarily to visible light. You can do amazing things in visible light, but one thing you cannot do is see galaxies that are literally invisible, which are those ones we're looking for. All of their light has been shifted to the infrared. They're not emitting any visible light that we can detect from, from Earth, and so uh, we're not going to be able to see them with Hubble. So what is going to help us with this is, as Caroline alluded to, the James Webb Space Telescope. This is the future. It's so exciting to be able to say finally that this telescope will launch this year. This is an animation of the launch of James Webb. It will launch from French Guiana off the coast of South America on October 31st of this year. Although I did just learn that that's a Sunday and they don't launch on Sundays. So there's a, a chance it'll maybe be November 1st, which is a little bit less uh, ominous. Uh, it's going to launch in an Ariane 5 rocket by uh, the European Space Agency. That's their contribution to the project. But the bulk of this telescope is funded by NASA. Once this telescope gets into space, that's when the scary part happens. It has to fit in a rocket, so it has to fold up. Now, once it's in space, it's got to unfold all of its components. Even the mirror, you can see, has some creases where it folds up. And if any of these mechanisms fail, it's not going to be great. So this is going to be fairly terrifying. Uh, if you watch the, the Perseverance landing or even the Curiosity landing a number of years ago, you might have heard some of the JPL scientists and engineers talk about seven minutes of terror while they're uh, waiting for this uh, rover to land on Mars. Well, this is going to be about three weeks of terror while this happens, waiting and making sure all of these mechanisms open up. The good news is they have been tested and tested and tested and tested and tested. And if you follow James Webb, you might know that it was supposed to launch a little while ago. One of the reasons why they haven't launched it yet is they're really trying to be careful and make sure it's going to work. But everything has been tested. Everything has passed their test. They just stowed the sun shield. That's that bit on the bottom, this thing here that's going to block the sunlight from uh, our sunlight from hitting the telescope mirror. They just stowed it for the last time. And it's basically about ready to get packed up to ship down to South America on a boat. I did another fun fact I learned recently. They're not going to tell anyone what day they're shipping it because they don't want pirates to take the telescope. So science operations will begin a little while later. It's going to take a little while to unfold the mechanism, of course, and it's also going to take a little while for the telescope to get out to its orbit. It's not going to go into Earth orbit like Hubble. It's going to go to a stable gravitational point about one million miles away. So it'll get there by about the end of this year. 
And then the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, Maryland, which runs this facility and runs Hubble, they're going to commission it, make sure everything's working, calibrate it, take some pretty pictures to release. And then science operations will begin in about summer of 2022. And this telescope is real, I can tell you, because I've seen it. I had the opportunity about a year and a half ago to fly to Los Angeles and visit North of Grumman and actually see the telescope with my own eyes. And this picture does not do it justice. It is very, very big. Um, so we, for reference, this mirror is about six and a half meters in diameter. Uh, so a very, very amazing observatory. So what is Webb bring? We're going to compare it back to Hubble. Webb brings a larger primary mirror, six and a half meters in diameter, which is about seven times the area of Hubble, so seven times the light gathering power. And it, as you might have guessed, is sensitive to infrared light, a little bit of visible light, but mostly infrared light. And so amongst the many things Webb can do, including probe the atmospheres of planets, as Caroline mentioned, is to detect light from extremely redshifted galaxies. And I'm, of course, excited to use this capability to fill in this missing gap in our knowledge about this time of the universe. So how do we actually do this in practice? We have the telescope now to do this. Well, we need to take a really deep image of the sky. And Hubble has done this. This is my favorite image so far. This is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. This is what happens if you take Hubble and you stare at one region of the sky for a couple hundred hours. And you can see that the universe is just filled with galaxies. It's an amazing photo. There's about 5,000 galaxies in this full photo. But if you look really closely, you can actually identify a lot of blank regions. Now you might wonder, are there no galaxies there or is Hubble just not big enough to find them or just not probing the correct wavelengths to find them? And so when we take our best guess at what we think the universe is actually doing using advanced theoretical models, we can simulate what we think would happen if you did a similar thing with Webb, open the shutter for a few hundred hours, and this is what we think you should see. And you can see this image is really filled with galaxies, so much so they're really starting to overlap each other no matter where you look. And this is the type of image I hope we can make in reality in just a few years. So how do we actually get this data? Uh, James Webb Space Telescope, like all telescopes, runs via a competitive peer review process. That means if uh, I want to do an observation, I have to write a proposal explaining why this question, the scientific question I have is interesting and explaining why this is the best telescope to do it. I then submit it and there is a telescope allocation committee that reviews all the proposals. This is actually happening right now for the second half of Webb's first year of observations. Um, Webb had about four times as many proposals submitted as there is time, and so it's extremely competitive. But even before they got to those regular proposals, the Space Telescope Science Institute decided they wanted to do an early release science program where right when science operations start, Webb would take observations spanning all areas of astronomy and give it to the astronomical community immediately. And the reason why is this is an expensive facility and they want to make sure everybody's got data in their hands as soon as possible. And so, of course, I was interested in this. I've been waiting for Webb for years. And so I worked with a group of about 20 of my closest collaborators and we crafted a proposal to do very distant galaxy science, which we submitted way back in August 2017. This is when we thought the telescope would launch in October 2018. So I submitted that proposal, immediately got on a plane to Oregon to go view the solar eclipse that was happening just a few days later. And a few months later, I got uh, one of the best emails I've ever received that announced our proposal was selected. So they selected 13 proposals out of more than 100 submitted, spanning everything from Jupiter to cosmology. And our program called the Cosmic Evolution Early Release Science Survey is the one they selected to do this distant universe exploration. Will we find the first galaxies? Will I be able to fill in that missing piece? SEERS, our program, is going to be excellent, and we will find galaxies than farther before. This image here on the right is a simulation. We've spent a while waiting for Webb, so we've started simulating what we think realistic data should look like. And this tiny little blip here is a really distant galaxy that we think we'll be able to find in the real data that's more distant than anything we found before. But this program will not find the first galaxies. And that's because those ultra deep fields, they need to be hundreds of hours of exposure. And this program is only about 60 hours. So as I mentioned, uh, uh, the Space Telescope Heinz Institute has just been reviewing proposals for the second half of Webb's first year. And so of course we put in another proposal try, to try to do much deeper observations. And we're trying to make the first Webb deep field. And what I'm showing here, you here on the bottom is a bunch of noise. This is what happens if you look at the most distant galaxies we think exist in the universe with our early release science program. It's not deep enough. We didn't expose long enough. There's no galaxies there. But with this new deeper program we proposed, 
these galaxies just pop right back out. Those might not seem too impressive. They don't look beautiful like Andromeda or M87, but those are what we think some of the first galaxies to form in the universe look like. So I don't know the results of this proposal. We'll find out in a month. But either way, we know that we're going to have some exciting data coming in. And so we'll, we will be probing this first half a billion years of the universe in the very, very near future. And with that, I'll thank you and take any questions. Can you hear me, Steve? Yes. Wonderful. So thank you very much for taking us on this wonderful journey. I, for one, I'm looking forward to the three weeks of terror. I think having GWS still on will be well worth it. So we have some questions for you from our audience. Uh, so our first question actually relates to something you said in the beginning, and it's from, let's see, it's from Michael. And Michael is asking about how do we date the beginning of our universe? Yeah, it's an excellent question. So the uh, main way in which we can actually measure the age of the universe is through that cosmic microwave background radiation. Um, when the universe formed, it should have been quite hot. And as the universe expanded, gas in the universe cooled. And actually that radiation itself has a temperature associated with it and it cooled. And by measuring the temperature of that radiation today, really measuring what wavelengths that light is emitted at, that allows us to figure out how much the universe has expanded. And then we can say, okay, let's rewind that movie. If the universe has expanded so much, let's rewind that movie and figure out when everything was essentially all at the same place. And that's the event that we call the Big Bang. And so when we do that, it's vastly more complicated than this explanation it involves a lot of comparison to models and more than just the age of the universe uh, is a parameter in that equation. But that's one of the more precise numbers we've been able to figure out. It's not 13.8, it's 13.82 billion years into the past. Great, thank you. And uh, we have a question next from Brian uh, who asks, how can cosmic background radiation be distinguished from all the galaxies in between? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, for the most part, the wavelengths that we see that radiation at, it's actually in what we call the microwave wavelength regime. It's a similar wavelength that your, uh, that your microwave emits at to heat your food. Um, uh, galaxies, for the most part, are not all that bright at those wavelengths. And so they don't really get in the way too much. Also, when you look in the universe, uh, especially with a telescope that made these uh, these observations, they would only be sensitive to see the most nearby galaxies at those wavelengths. And so if you look in the microwave, if you were to take a microwave picture of the universe, galaxies would take up a very, very, very small fraction of the area of that image. And a lot of what we learned from that image is statistical. We're measuring the average brightness of the cosmic microwave background and the average variation of different patterns. And so if things, some things are in the way, that's okay. The biggest problem is actually our Milky Way galaxy. We are in the Milky Way galaxy and we're looking through it to take this picture. And so we have to remove the disk of the Milky Way galaxy. And that's a huge foreground um, that they have to deal with. So it's a problem to, to deal with, but um, there are a lot of fairly advanced solutions for removing that component. Mm -hmm. And now I have a different kind of question. Um, I am not sure if that's from a parent, but potentially. So we have Arnav who asked you, as a cosmologist, Steve, is research the only option for a career? What are the type of job field do cosmologists go into? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, so for people who are interested in cosmology, um, research is, is definitely one way you can go. Um, but one exciting aspect of cosmology is instrumentation. And so there are a number of telescopes currently built and being built to study this early phase of the universe. And if you're not as interested in the research side, but you're still really interested in the topic, you can work uh, on building the telescopes. You can work on operating the telescopes. Um, you could also work for a national lab that does experiments related to the early universe. You could work uh, at maybe not, uh, you could work at the Space Telescope Science Institute, which runs web and deal with a whole bevy of issues there from working on the science, working on the data archives, working on instrumentation, working on the proposal management process, which is a huge, huge job. So there's, uh, I think, a lot out there that's definitely not just research. And of course, teaching. You can be a teacher, which is a fantastic thing. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and uh, I have a question uh, that's a little bit uh, related to the cosmic microwave background and the Big Bang. 
And the question um, is essentially from Nader, who asks, is there a way we can figure out what happened before the Big Bang? And if so, how possibly? Yeah, so I love this question because I don't know the answer to it. Um, so, but I have two things that I, that I like to say. One is the concept of before the Big Bang isn't a, a I guess I want to say a real concept because time did not exist before the Big Bang. And I'm glad that I'm not talking to you, Nadir, because we could debate it a lot and I would lose that debate. I'm not very good at defending this concept, but time as we know it did not exist before the Big Bang. There was no before the Big Bang. But you might say, what caused the Big Bang? Or, or maybe a better question is, why does our universe exist as a whole? And to that, I would say your answer is as good as mine. Um, there are theoretical physicists, theoretical astrophysicists that think of these problems, but most of them don't have testable solutions. So it's really, really difficult. Um, so maybe we'll learn more about that. Um, but for the most part, most of us are focused on what happened in the next 13.8 billion years after that event. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we are almost at the end of our session. And as the last question, Steve, I would again combine uh, someone from the audience question with my own. So again, the question from Trisha that pertained to how we use different telescope to answer questions, big picture question. And I will refocus this question a little bit by asking us, by asking you if you can talk a little bit about the Giant Magellan Telescope. This is a UT funded telescope. And how will that add into the big picture question you are addressing, uh, you know, after GWST is launched? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. I'm very glad to talk about the Giant Magellan Telescope or the GMT. Um, so we talked about the gain that you get from James Webb over Hubble. Webb is six and a half meters in diameter. Hubble is 2.4. The, the Giant Magellan Telescope is 25 meters in diameter. So it's an immense gain. The gain in light collecting, collecting power is more than the gain of Webb over Hubble. So as excited as I was to talk about Webb, it's even more so to talk about the GMT. Now it has one big drawback, which is that it's on the ground. And we love our atmosphere because it keeps us alive in so many ways, including absorbing uh, ultraviolet light that we heard about. Um, but one thing it does is it can block some light from reaching the ground. And at certain wavelengths in the infrared, the atmosphere actually glows. And so I mentioned how important it was to look in the infrared for these distant galaxies. The atmosphere glows in the infrared but it doesn't glow continuously, it glows at certain wavelengths. And so you can get around that and do some observations from the ground. So where I am the most excited for GMT to study the early universe is to take spectroscopy of galaxies. So everything I talked about today was imaging where you take a picture like the one behind me. Um, but if we wanna learn details about these galaxies, we need to take a spectrum, which is where you take the light from a galaxy, use something like a prism and spread it into its component wavelengths. And that can tell you vastly more information, such as a precise distance to the galaxy, the amount of heavy elements that are in the galaxy, even the motions of stars in the galaxy. And that's going to be really difficult to do with James Webb for these really distant objects. We're really gonna need the light collecting power of GMT. And so I hope that we are doing very deep spectroscopic observations with the GMT a decade from now on those galaxies that we're gonna find in the next few years with James Webb. Great, excellent. So thank you very much. Uh, it's unfortunately time to uh, start wrapping up our session now. So as we start to wrap up, I want to take a minute to thank Steve and Caroline again. Thank you very much, Caroline and Steve, for your research and for keeping Texas at the forefront of scientific excellence. We obviously have a lot more to look for and we should have you up here again. And also thank you all to the wonderful members of the audience on a Friday afternoon who joined us today. Uh, please be sure to visit, let me just check the website here, sciencefest.utexas.edu to sign up for more sessions. The Science Festival is continuing till late March. And if you do have questions for the session today, please contact cnsdev at austin.utexas.edu if you have any comments and follow up from today's session. So thank you very much for your interest in Texas science. And we do hope to see you again in a future session for the Science Texas Festival. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. <laughs>